Hi, everybody. I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy specialist at Maine State Library. And tonight I'm going to do something a little different. Instead of talking about something specific for genealogy, I'm going to do a little talking about what books I've chosen to buy for my personal genealogy library, which isn't really that big. It's a small bookshelf because you know, I joke that I'm half New England Yankee and half Scots. And so, you know, on the thrifty or frugal side, plus I work in a library, so it really doesn't make sense for me to invest, you know, especially on a librarian salary, a lot of money on books. But at the same time, I love books and there's some things where I still think it's worth having a book in front of you. And so on a few of these, it's gonna be, this is a book I think is valuable. And on some of them it's going to be, this is a type of book I think is valuable for you to have. Um, because what I'm interested in may not be where your ancestors were from. And so it would be a case of you finding a similar book that fits your interests. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. So the first thing I suggest most people do is to get one basic general guide to how to do genealogy. And this is one of those things that, yes, a lot of it's online, but a lot of it online is, there's a bit here and a bit there, and it's not put together as a coherent whole. And so I happen to have this one, um, which is George Morgan's How to Do Everything Genealogy. It's part of a series that's like the Dummies or Complete Idiot's Guides. Um, the reason I have this one is because it showed up at a used book sale, which is a little unusual for genealogy books. Um, genealogy books don't seem to show up at used book sales that often. Um, you can get them used at Amazon sometimes or other online book sellers, but I have almost never seen them show up at used book sales. Well, this one happened too. And so I bought it for a dollar because I, I did not have a general intro one in my library and I figured I probably should. Um, the next, if, if you're at the point where you really need heavy duty reference, and this is heavy in more ways than one, um, this is the source, a guidebook to American genealogy Edited, edited by Loretto Denizooks and Sandra Hargraves Loopking. And I will put these together into a, um, a document I send out. Um, this is, as you can see, it's not a lightweight book. And they cover here with different authors. Um, census records, church records, immigration records, land records. Often when I, part of how I've decided what things to do presentations on is where I'm focusing on how to, I didn't quite go down the list of their chapters, but I came real close because, and you know, and their chapters are hefty. Um, I don't know if you can see this that well, but they give, examples of documents you'll be using if you can see the sample um they have like here for the 1870 census they have a snapshot of it. um and they go through each census and tell you what's on it so this this one finding the third edition which is the most recent is tough. This is online and bits and pieces at Ancestry. The second edition is easy to get a hold of used. And it's not a bad bargain. You know, the, the chapter on doing um, genealogy on the computer is outdated. But most of the, the core information, I, I expect most of you heard me say that 
you know, the records haven't changed, how we access them has. You know, and the 1870 census is still the 1870 census. And an 1823 baptism record is the same now as it was in 1873 and when it was written in 1823. So, this is a case if, if you look at somewhere and can't find this at a reasonable price, if you decide to get it and you get the second edition, you're not missing a whole lot. Um, but I have seen the second edition on sale for less than $10. Uh, Pam has it. Yes. Pam, do you agree that it's, it's worth having? I think so. I haven't used it a lot. <laughs> And um, I'm surprised I even have it. I think I got it at a library book sale. Yeah. Um, library book sales are one place you will sometimes find genealogy books um, because they are, a lot of libraries are getting rid of reference collections because their budgets are tight, their spaces are even tighter. And that's that's a a, a, a real problem. Um, I, you know, I'm having to make some decisions at the state library about what I keep because you know we're out of space, and there's no way the state's building us an extension of the building. I mean, we were lucky to get the roof fixed when it was leaking, so I'm going to have to make some decisions about how to keep the collection fresh and deal with space issues. <laughs> um, so anyhow, next one, this is Blaine Bettinger's intro to DNA. Um, I bought the first edition. I have not bought the second edition. I figure when the third edition comes out, I'll replace this. Um, the library has the second, the library got two copies of the second edition, one that is library use only and one that circulates. So if I ever need the second edition, I can get at it. Um, this is the basic how to, what it means, explains everything. Um, and you know, once the state library reopens and we have interlibrary loan, you can get copies of this to read. Uh, you know, I'm a huge believer in using your library. I'm gonna put this one over here for the moment because it's on top of some of the others. Um, now, definitely in the category of things where I'm talking about the type of book rather than a particular book that is helpful is this. My interest is in Scotland. So I have books on tracing your Scottish ancestry. I have one on Scottish graveyards. I have one on Scottish land records. This is just a little pamphlet type. Down and Out in Scotland, Researching Ancestral Crises. <laughs> um, one of the things that Ancestry has done for genealogy, you know, when I started doing this 20 plus years ago, and I'm not going to admit to how long that is, um, it was like pulling teeth. It was the beginning of computer indexes. And it could be like pulling teeth to get somebody to look at an original record. And Ancestry has helped get people past that because the original records are there. But what happens is people just jump in and don't get the background on the time and place they're researching. And books like this can help you figure out what is going to be in that um, census record? What's going to be, you know, is it worth looking at land records? What are wills called? How are they, um, you know, because in, in Scotland, sorry, 
what are deeds called in Scotland? They've got a different name. And so you need to know that. Um, this is my favorite. Um, again, it's a third edition. But the thing I like best about this is he has, and I'll show you another book where it's even more complete. The, one of the best um, glossaries of words that are either unique to Scotland or have changed meaning over the years. And he, so in addition to that, you know, he covers things like, you know, he, here's what this word means. Um, he also did, yeah. You, uh, show, show us the title of that again and read the title. It's hard to see. Okay, this one is just called Scottish Genealogy. And it's by somebody named Bruce, a man named Bruce Dury, D-U-R-I-E. Um, and again, this, this one's actually surprisingly heavy. It doesn't look, but it's done on really nice paper. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, um, and he also did, and this may be, I'm not sure this is my favorite genealogy book, but it's possibly my favorite book about genealogy records themselves as opposed to theory of genealogy. This is called Understanding Documents for Genealogy and Family History. It's also by Bruce Dury. And he goes through, and if you're dealing in, with UK genealogy at all, it's amazing. He, he goes through what a will should say. He's got a huge glossary of both that includes Scots words, obsolete words, Latin words that you will find in church and legal records. Um, he talks about how ca the calendars changed. Um, let's see what else he's got here. His, you know, so he has stuff about um, reading old handwriting, just an incredible array of stuff that. I find that I really need for what I work on. And so you know, there's, for example, if you're doing Eastern European, there's another one called something like following their footsteps or something like that, I can find it for you. That is, um, and I'll talk about that when I talk about when the records aren't in English um, in a later one of these that, goes through and trans you know, shows you typical Polish and Russian certificate. I'm glad I'm not the only one with the, <laughs> um, you know, Polish and Russian documents and what they're going to look like and has lists of words in Russian that you need to know to be able to pick out. Um, so, you know, if you're dealing in Eastern Europe, this isn't going to help you, but that other one will. Um, same thing there, there's, um, I know there's a similar book for Italy, which I ha haven't used in a long time, but again, it tells you, and it breaks down because there's, because Italy wasn't a united country until the late 1800s, things were done in different ways in different parts of the country, and it breaks that sort of thing down of, you know, here's what a will in Southern Italy is likely to look like, and here's how it's likely to look in Northern Italy. Um, so that's something really handy is to, to find, and if you aren't sure what it is, I'm happy to help you figure it out, is to find the best book that gives you that background on what documents you're going to find, what they're likely to say, um, what does a typical one look like? What does, you know, Scotland, for example, had what was called irregular marriages, where if you stood up, if a man and a woman stood, stood up in front of two witnesses and declared themselves married, they were married legally. Now, the church didn't like it. You know, the Presbyterian church did not like this tradition, this legal tradition, but you know, it was legal. That's one reason, if you've heard of Gretna Green, the runaway marriages from England, 
that was the first, if you went north from England, Gretna Green was the first place you hit in Scotland. And so people who were trying to get married without parental permission in England could get married in Scotland easily. So that's, you know, that kind of thing is you need to know because those marriages are going to have a different type of record than church marriages. And so you know, it's so easy at Ancestry to just jump in and find records, but you're finding them in isolation. And that sort of step from going to just scattershot searching to really researching your family is knowing what records you're supposed to find or you're likely to be able to find and what they should tell you and what you should go looking for when you're not finding it by a quick search at Ancestry. Does that make sense to everybody? And that kind of introduction to, you know, some of these get very specific. Here's one, just tracing your Edinburgh ancestors. It's looking, and there's another one on chip, tracing your Glasgow ancestors. So it's looking at a very small geographic area. This publisher's also done them for a lot of the counties in England. Um, and for the size of book, they're pretty good. They're, you know, so if it, you know, I haven't bought it yet, but I am planning to get the, um, the Yorkshire one because my mother's family came from Yorkshire. Um, and those are, you know, this is getting really specific, but it tells me about the records that are right there in Edinburgh. Similarly, I have two here. Tracing your nonconformist ancestors and tracing your Jewish ancestors. Again, these are from the publisher Pen and Sword. Um, they do a lot of military history books as well. They're very British, but you know, I had Quaker and you know um, Puritan ancestors in England, and many. This one I actually got for free for doing a review of it, um, you know, which is always a nice way to get books. I'm, I'm more than willing to read a book and write a you know five paragraph review if I get the book for free. Um, but I've done work for a lot of my friends who are Jewish. And so that's been really helpful. Now, I haven't done much work with Catholic records, but if your family's Catholic, it's worth finding a book on what records the Catholic church kept and when, um, you know, what, what was the priest required to write down? What it, did he tend to write down and what were you lucky that he wrote down? Um, one, when I was at Roots Tech, one of the presentations I went to that was fascinating that um, if I ever get to do my English genealogy talk for you guys, um, I'm going to talk about it. It's the parish chest registers or records. And there's literally a chest in the old English parishes of the, you know, the Anglican church, and it's literally a chest, the size of a trunk or a little bigger. And they not only kept the birth merit, you know, the baptism bans and burials registers in there, but you know, they kept the, the deacon's records and all, you know, anything for poor relief, all of that. So again, if, if you've got English ancestors tracking down those records, if they were Church of England, is very helpful. And there, are, there is a book about them. Um, so that's, um, yeah, see here, parish records. This covers the, the parish church records. Um, so, you know, if you're, I don't know that there's a book on Eastern Orthodox records. I can tell you from painful experience the Baptists didn't keep many records, and the Methodists kept them, but they were kept by the minister, who was often a circuit rider early on. And so even though the minister would have kept them, they're probably not saved, or they're saved in some really odd place that is gonna, you're not going to be able to find. 
Um, but certainly for something like Catholic records, you know, if I were to start doing a lot of work in Catholic records, let's say, you know, I was working for people you know, with French Canadian records. Those are going to be Catholic and I'd probably find a book at the library. I'd probably, if the library doesn't have a good book about Catholic records, I'd probably have the library buy it at this point because it should have it. Um, so what else have I got here? It's, um, this is about reading old Scottish handwriting. And there are other books like this. Kip Sperry did one on reading colonial New England handwriting, which my copy is in storage. Um, but it's a really handy look at reading early handwriting. So I, that type of thing, you'll find, now some of that, the, the old handwriting, some of that is easiest to look at online or is easy to look at online. There are good, the people doing paleography, which is the study of old handwriting, um, have done some really good online tutorials and guides because that's actually something that Universe, certain university departments have an interest in. And so the university departments or archives have done how to read old Italian handwriting. Um, the Folger Shakespeare Library in DC, as well as, I think it's either Oxford or Cambridge, I can't remember which one off the top of my head, has a really good how to read older English handwriting. Scotland's National Archives has a good how to read Scottish handwriting. Um, so you know, that you can start online and that should probably get you through it. Um, does that make sense to everybody? That that's one where I'm, I'm saying yet, yeah, if you're looking to do this on a budget, there is good old handwriting information on the internet because that's got a an academic side where the people who've put together the what's online are archivists or professors. So locally, one of my favorite books, um, and my cat is doing I don't know what. No, baby. Don't be too much of a stinker, please. I know, it's all nice and new and interesting because I moved to the chair. The Maine Old Cemetery Association put out the Maine Cemetery Trampers Companion. And this is great because it goes through what symbols you'll find on a, um, on stones, what they mean, so, you know, for example, um, an eagle met, often meant military service. A harp represents the connection between heaven and earth. Um, let's see, you know, a gate re represents the passage to a next life. Um, abbreviations for military medals that might be listed. Um, all sorts of, um, interesting information. Um, this is one MOCA, the, you know, the Maine Old Cemeteries Association is often at local um, conferences and they're selling that. I think it's $20. And it's, it's, if, if you are going to be doing a lot in cemeteries, it's worth having because sometimes some of the symbols on a you can get things that are related to being a mason or somebody died young and things like that. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple that are a little quirkier. This is one of my favorites and it's technically not a genealogy book. It's called Albion's Seed, Four British Folkways in America. And what it does is it looks at the, early, the, the demography historical sociology, whatever you want to call it, 
of four groups in the colonies. Um, it's the, the New England Puritans, the Pennsylvania Quakers, um, the Scots-Irish, and the Virginia plantation types. And so, you know, when I talk, you ever hear me talk about any statistics with colonial New England, they've probably come out of this book. You know, average age of marriage, typical age of death, what were the common names? I don't always agree with his um, conclusions. I think he's a little strong on them sometimes because he, he, he said, and I, I think some of it's true where he's talking about, you know, these four different types of early settlers started with very different types of communities and we can still see the um, effects today. Um, but his, his data is second to none in terms of collecting things like, you know, how many children on average did a marriage have? You know, this is one where, you know, you've heard me talk about the average age of women getting married in colonial New England is not 16, it's 19 to 22. He's got the evidence in here. Um, and so that kind of background information can be really helpful. Let's see what else I got down here. One of the few, one of the other books I got, um, I have not bought the entire Great Migration series. It's too expensive. Um, I don't have the shelf space. I did buy this one that's the Immigrants to Plymouth Colony up until 1633. And it has sketches about just the Plymouth Colony ones, not Massachusetts Bay, not Connecticut or Rhode Island. Um, if you can see the post-it notes, each of those post-it notes is highlighting an ancestor of mine. And so I decided that this was worth having because as of the time of publication, this is the state of the art information about these early Plymouth settlers about whom there is a whole lot of crappy research because people have decided to, you know, they, they take things that were written 120 years ago seriously, or they want to, you know, there were people on the Mayflower who had common last names like Rogers and White. And so somebody whose ancestor appeared later with that name, they try to shoehorn them into the Mayflower family. Um, and so this is sort of the definitive look at those, this is done by Robert Charles Anderson from the New England Historical and Genealogical Society. It is basically just the Great Migration sketches for the Plymouth settlers for the first 13 years of the colony. And because of so much mythology around them, I decided this was worth having. Um, My favorite genealogy book is also by Robert Charles Anderson. Those of you who made it to the Genealogy Club Christmas party, this is the one, one of the ones I had as a door prize. Um, this book, more than anything, it's called Elements of Genealogical Analysis, How to Maximize Your Research Using the Great Migration Study Project Method. Has shaped how I think about genealogy, the theory behind what we're doing. Um, you know, he has lots and lots of cases where he needs to decide, is the Thomas Smith who settled in Duxbury, Massachusetts, Plymouth Colony in 1634, the same one who then appears in, you know, Salem or Boston or Cambridge or Watertown five years later, or is it a different one? And there may only be those two records. How do you figure it out? Um, and he talks a lot about, you know, how can you be sure that these two different records apply to the same person? And reading this is, and, and working through this 
was actually the almost more than anything else I've done in genealogy. What helped me see, it really helped me get to being a good researcher and not just snagging records. Um, you know, it's actually not that big a book, but it's pretty dense. Um, and I go back and reread parts of it periodically just to keep myself on track. Um, and let's see. That's getting close to it. Um, as I said, I don't buy huge numbers of books, partly because I work at a library. Um, but I'm not, I don't, at this point, I don't feel like, you know, I'm not buying family histories. Um, I'm not buying um, many things that are out of a vanity press which a lot of family histories are these days, where it's basically self-published. Um, but yeah, I would, I would highly recommend you know, the, the general basic how to do genealogy, a book about your specific geographic area of interest, um, a DNA book if you're doing that, probably Blaine Bettinger's. There's also, he's, I don't know where I have the other one must be out in the other room. Um, one of the ones I'm not pulling out, like I've got a big huge, land records are very specific and I have a book on land records, but the library has it. So I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, for those of you who come into the library somewhat frequently, it's in the library. Um, I'm trying, you know, one of my goals with the state library is to have enough of these books that are good that circulate so that if you aren't here in Augusta that you can go into your local library and have the book delivered. Um, so that's one of the things I'm working through right now is we have a bunch of books that I think are very helpful but we have one copy that's library use only and I'm working on building up getting a second copy that we can allow to circulate so that those of you who aren't here in Augusta can use them. Or those of you who are here in Augusta can take them home for a week or two and really work through them and bring it back. Um, so that's part of what I'm doing with that. Um, I think that's most of the ones I wanted to share with you. Um, let me make sure before I, yeah. Oh, no, there's one more. Um, there's now a second edition of this out, which I have not bought yet because I ordered it for the library. And this is called Professional Genealogy. And it's about much more of the business side. Um, but some of it's helpful. Um, it talks about copyright and fair use. It talks about um, doing a research plan. It talk the, the one one of the really good ones is it talks about time management, and it's talking about it from the standpoint of if you're working for somebody else. But I found it very helpful looking at how do I manage my private research time, which is somewhat you know I do genealogy all day at work, and I don't have time until I come home to work on my own. And so I want to be efficient because you know, I have other hobbies. I mean, I know some of you will be surprised to hear this, but I do things other than genealogy as well. And so I want to work at being as efficient as I can be um, so that I still have time for knitting and swimming and other things that I enjoy doing. Um, there's a bit about how to transcribe some, how to do a transcript versus an abstract, information about how to analyze the evidence you found. So it's, it's not quite strictly professional genealogy. This is a bit closer to being advanced genealogy techniques. Um, so I found that very helpful to have. Um, as I said, there's a new edition that's come out. I ordered it for the library. I haven't read it carefully yet. Um, 
but that's those are the general books you know so there are other advanced genealogy books there, there's an advanced dna book um there are books about different geographic locations i've got the english one here that again is you know like this thick and all you ever needed to know about english records but you know if you're and it's expensive but it's one of the on most of these my answer is if a book costs you 45 dollars but saves you 20 hours of research over the next year because you know what you're doing as opposed to doing sort of scattershot grabbing stuff that's worth it <laughs> at least to me so I'm going to open it up. Anybody else have books that they found really helpful um, with understanding general genealogy or particular skills? I was going to mention a couple. Um, the Fillmore Atlas in English of Parish Registers in England. Yes. Might be of use for people because otherwise it's like, how do you find out where St. Dunstan Church someplace is? Well, that's what this says. This covers England and a little bit on Scotland also. Yeah, that's one a lot. That's a wonderful example of where a lot of that information is online, but it's chopped up. Yeah. And you get a bit here and you get a bit there. And that particular one, um, it's nice to have the book to be able to see the context. It also has good maps. Yes. And I'm a huge fan of good maps, as I think most of you know. Um, because you know, as you know, people think that nobody traveled before the railroad was invented, and that's not true. You will find people getting married three parishes away from where they lived. Um, so, but yet, Wayne, that is, you know, again, that's sort of exactly what I wanted to pull out is that information is online in the various places, but it's really chopped up. So, if you're doing a lot of English research, that is one that would be worth having um so thank you wayne perfect answer <laughs> i have a suggestion uh evidence explained by um the second edition yeah elizabeth mills. shown mills yes yes always a classic always you know there you yeah know, with, you know basic genealogy i'm always referring to it yeah um those are the the oh, it, again it's a big huge book that you don't read cover to cover no <laughs> <laughs> but um again that's a case where i have a copy it's in storage um i moved and i haven't quite got gotten everything out of storage um but it tells you it has some about how to analyze evidence and it also has a whole lot about how to cite your sources you know it, you, you it lives know on it, my desk yeah mine lives, mine lives on my desk yeah um the graduate program i did in genealogy uses a different system for sourcing things um but yeah i know where evidence is explained is in the library and i walk over there a couple times a month to check on something um i freely admit that and we have a text one oh yeah the length and breadth of maine um which is all about maine place names we actually have that by the reference desk at the library it's not even out on you know it's it, it's open shelves so you can use it but it's it's one that the reference librarians the four of us have on our little shelf behind the reference desk um of things we refer to all the time about Maine and that is on that shelf um and that's there are other books like that there's a similar one whose name I've forgotten for Massachusetts and I know there's one for Pennsylvania and it's the one for Massachusetts and the one for Pennsylvania both do what this one does where they look at both obsolete names and the areas within a town where you, you get you know, like over in Western Maine, in Otis Field, there's the area called Bolsters Mills. And in Norway, there's Hunt's Corner. And it def 
tells you where in the town they or which town those places are in. Um, the one for Pennsylvania, I think, may even have maps for some of that. Um, but particularly here, I'm, you know, th that's less of an issue if you're researching further west. Um, but if, if you're on the East Coast, there are an awful lot of obscure place names that are no longer used or that have been changed. You know, the town I grew up in partly, Norway, was originally Rustfield. And interestingly, in the 1790 census, because of using a long S for the S in Rustfield, it got indexed at Ancestry as Raffield Gore instead of Rustfield Gore. And I only found it by knowing the name of one of the early settlers and putting that in and finding it and looking at going, wait a minute, Raffield? Oh, I see how they got that. You know, I had to work, you know, reverse engineer how they got that name. And it, it took me a couple of minutes because I was not expecting Raffield, um, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so yeah, books are great for genealogy and it's worth, you know, taking a look. And this is a case where, you know, sometimes just putting in the name of a country or a Catholic genealogy in a search in, in a library's catalog under keyword and see what comes up. Because sometimes doing a little of this background research can save you a lot of time in the long run. BJ, it's Nancy. Um, hi, Nancy. Was, hi. Um, what was the name of that land use uh, records book you were referring to? Oh, let me pull it out. Hang on. <laughs> it sounds heavy. It is. Um, land and Property Research in the United States by E. Wade Cone. Excellent. And um, you like that one? Yeah, it's, um, it's very much a reference book. Yeah. Um, they've got a lot of maps from like the old land boundary offices for the states that did federal land. Um, the, li the, the state library has a copy. It's library use only. Okay. I happen, this was one of those, I admit I sometimes put things in my, um, uh, Thank you. Land, and, land and, property. and property research in the United States. I have an Amazon list of things I would like to get, but I'm not willing to pay the price that they're currently at. <laughs> uh, hey, Amazon lets you do a whole lot of, it's my um, Amazon wish list is actually kind of scary. It's, well, actually, let me take it back. My Amazon wish list is either a work of art or it's really scary. And so, you can do private lists. Oops. You can do private lists that no one else can see. And I have one that is books I will buy if I can find a copy cheap enough. Hey, Wayne, I joke. You know, I'm half Yankee, half Scots. I'm not <laughs> living on a librarian salary. I am not, you know, you know. As librarians get paid in Maine, those of us who work at the state library are in pretty good shape, but that's only in comparison. Um, and so what I've done is when I put a, a one on there, you can put notes on it. Um, and I put what I think I'd be willing to pay. And every couple of weeks I go in and they, they will tell you what the lowest current price is on a book. And this is one that I had on there for like two years. And suddenly there was one copy that was $17 when it was always 40. And I was, I put 15 as my max. And I was like, you know what? For 17, I'm getting that one. <laughs> <laughs> because that was before I was actually working at the state library. So I didn't have access to it the same. Now I might not bother because I, you know, it's there in the live, but that's one that I am going to put in if we can get a copy um, to get a circulating copy. Um, just because I think it's one that would be nice to have a copy that, you know, those of you can either order or get, take home from the library. Um, 
but yeah, I just, I, I hope this has given you some thoughts about, you know, if you're developing a collection of books about genealogy and about what you're researching, there's no one size fits all of what books are, you know, if you have ancestors who were only in Maine, you may not want that land and property one. You may want to just work with finding answers for how deeds worked in Maine. But if you're doing really in-depth research or you're working in states that did much more of the land grant type thing, that may be worth getting. Um, you know, my favorite books on, on understanding documents is really kind of Scotland and UK focused. Um, that's another one I want to get another copy for the library, just so that we have um, a copy that circulates. Um, I have another collection over here that I didn't start pulling stuff out about um, Colonial Essex County, which, you know, because of what it is, ends up being a lot of Salem witchcraft trials. Um, because that's what people have written about. Um, but there are some others there as well. Um, there's a sociological study that was done in the early 1970s. So again, there's some um, conclusions about theory that I don't necessarily agree with, but like with the Albion seed, he has really good data about family structure in colonial Andover, Massachusetts. And since I'm descended from half the people he talks about in that book, it was worth me having just to have the, the data. Um, I have a couple other books here, um, you know, that the National Genealogical Society put out about genealogical proof um, and documentation that are workbooks. Um, that are really helpful. Um, but that may not be something that, you know, that my genealogy geek heart loves that sort of stuff. Um, I have a, you know, book that's on the UK census. I know there are books on the US census. I don't happen to have bought one. But, you know, if, if you're doing a lot of work in census records, at least getting it from the library to, to read some of the what you really are and aren't able to tell from the census is worth it. On the other hand, the chapter out of the source will give you three quarters of that anyway. At least three quarters, maybe more. <laughs> so any other comments from people? I was just gonna pass on a, a tongue in cheek thing. I was doing a lot of research back in Washington DC and a genealogy friend of mine said, Good heavens, you're doing so much research, you're going to go, go back so far, you're going to need to get the book, Tracing Your Trilobite Ancestors. Yeah, <laughs> I will also, well, the reason I'm laughing at that, the worst family history I've ever seen, and let me tell you, there's some real competition for the worst family history book ever written, <laughs> is one that was put together about the pup, the Putnams of Danvers, Massachusetts. And it was really frustrating because first of all, it made it sound like it covered the whole family. And it turned out it was just the author's direct line. And I've forgotten exactly how it started, but I can paraphrase. And it was something like 10,000 years ago, this happened. And then 5,000 years ago, this happened. And then John Putnam was born in, you know, 1598 in Aston Abbott's England. And I'm sitting here going, I have huh? the book. You I, have that one? I have the book because I'm descendant of the Putnams. <laughs> Me too. And I just sat there going. I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only, but you know, you, you understand that it was just. Yes. I think it was like 10,000 years ago, the glacier retreated. And then I forget, ex but it was just, it was. Let's just say the last time I moved, I decided to pitch it. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and I didn't even recycle it. It went straight into the trash. Oh. It's one of the few books that I've actually given a bad review on Amazon to. The other one is a murder mystery that had no murder or mystery to it. That's bad. <laughs> yeah. I think the it was the end of a series, and I think the woman had a contract. She had to deliver one more book, so she sent the first draft to the editor who put it through. Um, so, okay, so, yeah. You know, I try to not be too negative about things, but that book really, yeah. Um, so, I hope you guys found this sort of thought. It, I meant this more to be thought provoking than a, you need to buy this book and you need to buy that book. It's more, you know, this is a book I found helpful or this is a category of book I found helpful. Um, so, thank you, Wayne. I'm trying to find topics that are, you know, coming up with two topics a week that I think other people, that I can do in an hour that I think other people will get use from. It, you know, and I'm doing this series and I'm doing a series for librarians. So I'm doing four of these a week to well, come up with. A, you're doing a good job. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. I As I said, a lot of the, this one won't, but some of the others are going to turn up again in the rotation, um, especially when I can start traveling again. But thank you guys for coming. I'm going to um, stop the recording now.